we have Caleb Hatting. Caleb is a longtime pythonista of some 15 years. Though a chemical engineer by training, he has worked on a wide variety of projects, including mathematical modeling, financial and CRM software, servers for capturing GPS data from IoT devices, and founded the online Coder Moji service to provide a more effective way of learning to become a programmer. Please welcome Caleb and his talk, So You Want to Make a Screencast? First things first, is anyone from Dev Demand here? There we go. So um, I would not be here unless Dev Demand had provided me with a ticket to attend PyCon, which they did in addition to being a platinum sponsor. So can we please give another round of applause to Dev Demand? OK, so this is a meta presentation. Currently three levels deep, I'd like it to go another level. And what I mean by that is this is a presentation about another presentation that I gave, which was launched by a previous presentation. And I'll get into how that happened. So very quickly, I did a ninja edit because in Amber's talk right before this one, it was made out that um, Semver is bad and Calvary is good, so I had to quickly change uh, my history there. Um, I've been using Python for a long time in quite a wide variety of domains. And my most recent big project was producing the screencast that this talk is about. I also spent quite a few months last year building that site, CodeEmoji.com, which I'm not going to speak too much about now. And that's my blog address. So what we're going to cover in this talk. Um, this talk is pretty much about how I got into the position to produce content for O'Reilly, who, who was a publisher for the screencast. And I'm going to speak a little bit about what that process is like because I had no prior experience to doing any of that when I, when I began this, which I imagine is the same for, for, many, for many of you. And then I'll speak a little bit about what, what equipment you need, which turns out to be not that much, really, and some tips and tricks and hints about how to deal with tricky content to, to show it on the screen and to show users how they can get things done. So just to go back to this slide, that section in bold there is what this talk is about. Um, it is a ridiculously large course on, on O'Reilly about how to learn Cython. I, I think I exceeded what was required by at least 50%, possibly more. And the history of how I got into this position proceeds as follows. So I had just come off the tail of working for about four years on a dynamic model for coal combustion. And at that stage, all that there was really to learn from was the, the Cython documentation. And in my opinion, the Cython documentation is actually extremely good documentation. It doesn't seem that way. It seems pretty crude when you look at it. But what I found was every time I wanted to do something, it was in the documentation. It was almost as if by magic. Every time there was a particular situation where I, I just couldn't get something to work right, I would find it in the published documentation. I almost never had to read the source code, which, is, which I think is pretty amazing. However, a lot of people do struggle from online published documentation, and so it turned out O'Reilly had a need for a screencast. So this is the point of the story where we get to, to where the publisher comes into the picture, and this, is really, this was really interesting to me. So coming off the tail end of all that work, I gave a local Cython talk at the uh, Bros Pi meetup. And um, it was very well received, and two of the people in particular, Clinton Roy, who is here, and Nick Coglin, who may be here, I don't, I don't know, they encouraged me to submit a talk proposal for PyCon itself, which I didn't think really would be a good topic, but I did it anyway. So those of you who were there and maybe saw me last year give the talk on Cython. So after that talk was accepted, I got a message from O'Reilly to make me an offer to do the screencast. And the weird thing about this was that I had not yet actually given the talk. The contract was finalized before I even gave the talk at PyCon. And then about six months after that, the course was completed and published. So to dig into that a little bit further, this was the first email that I got from O'Reilly, um, a cold email out of the blue. And I got permission for this email from Meg, who is no longer at O'Reilly, but she was one of the publishers who, who were focusing on Python at the time. You don't have to read it all, but this is, this is really fascinating to me. So <laughs> publishers go through talk schedules to see who's speaking on what 
and to see who would be able to complete certain sections in their portfolio that they don't have coverage of yet. That was really interesting. They had an author who had produced a book on Cython, but he was contractually prevented from producing any video material. And so they had this hole in their schedule. And Meg noticed my talk on the Python AU schedule and asked if I, if I would do it. They're based in the US, they're not based in Australia. And I thought that was really interesting that these publishers actually do go through the schedules of, of um, local PyCons. So next steps. You might think that there is a very long and lengthy process that happens after this about how you line all the ducks up to get the content made. It turns out not to be so. The first thing that they ask for is for you to submit a table of contents. I was very rigorous about doing this and it was extremely detailed and lengthy because I was presuming that someone at some later point would trim it down and cut out all the fat. No, I'll get to, I'll get to why that's a problem in a moment. So, and then you have to submit a demo video so that they can hear what you sound like to see if it's going to be appropriate for, for listeners. And then there's a very simple contract that you have to sign and there's some US tax stuff that you have to do. For some reason, I'm now registered in the US to pay tax. I'm not, I'm not a citizen, I don't know why that is, but apparently that's required. And then you begin filming, and that's pretty much it. There is not a lot of ceremony to, to do this. Uh, I found out later that O'Reilly really does treat you as the domain expert. They do not have a lot of supervision about what the content is. They rely on you heavily to make sure that that is all correct. Which brings us back to the table of contents. So if you produce a table of contents that's 80 odd videos, then that becomes, <laughs> how your contractual obligations are defined. So you have a royalty scheme, 25%, 50%, and 100%, and you have to meet those targets. And those percentages are based on the number of videos that you said you would do, <laughs> which in my case was, was quite an extensive list. So then you do the work and you put in the time, and finally, eventually, um, against, against all odds, the video goes online and you can see your name on the O'Reilly page, and um, that feels pretty good when you finally reach that point. So let's go back to our historical um, sequence where we finished with it getting published in March. So you may have noticed in the previous slide that the video content is around five and a half hours. When last have you watched a five and a half hour video? <laughs> when last have you made five and a half hours of edited footage? It was an enormous amount of work. It's it was intended to be an introduction to Cython, but by the time I finished it, it was actually pretty comprehensive. So um, it was three months of work, and that three months was full-time, unpaid work. I, I didn't have a job at the time in order to make sure that I could get this, get this all done and get on with the rest of my life. So that's a big sacrifice. That's, that, that is a major sacrifice. And anyone who's published will tell you that the money that you get from this is just never going to cover the time that you put in. That's, th that is not the reason to do this work. So. Big question, why, why do it? Why do it at all? It's perhaps a bit trite, but I just enjoy teaching. The, realistically, there was not a, a great likelihood of me saying no. Um, I, I'm wearing a Jungle Girls t-shirt. I volunteer at a lot of places. I've even worked at a Rails Girls event. I, I'm easy, I'll do almost anything. So why go with a publisher? I had thought about doing screencasting before, but never really got into it. But when O'Reilly came along and said, please do this, I jumped at the chance. And these are the reasons why. The first big reason is credibility. Many of the people that I look up to in, in the Python community have published with O'Reilly. This is a really awesome book. Um, one of the authors is Dave Beasley. Dave Beasley is one of my favorite uh, Pythonistas. If you think you know Python well, you think you're an advanced Python programmer, when you read this book, you will suddenly realize that what you thought you knew was just a small fraction of what, what is available to learn. So credibility for me was, was the big thing. To be able to get published with such um, legendary people, and of course Graham Dumpled in the audience as well is another O'Reilly published author. It, it meant a lot to me to be able to join that community in some way. Expertise. and. Here the expertise I'm referring to is publishing and screencasting and what are best practices, how to format your content, what font sizes to use, how to prepare the videos, what pace should be required and all those things. I didn't want to really learn all, that, all of that stuff myself and O'Reilly is in the business of producing that material and getting feedback from users. So I thought it would be a shortcut way for me to learn, to learn how to do all that stuff. 
And then, of course, marketing and hosting of the video content. O'Reilly takes that off your hands, so I don't need to worry about any of that if, if I were comparing this with making my own material. And then, of course, deadlines. Deadlines turned out to be the big, one of the big deliverables that O'Reilly gives you because they force you to meet your deadlines. They, they don't force you, but they tie it into your remuneration. So if you don't meet the deadlines, your royalty decreases. So every time I was approaching a deadline, I would, um, the day started to get longer, and I put, put more videos out, and then finally, before the, before the US time when the deadline would be cut off, I'd do five videos that day. So the deadlines really do help. They really do help to push through the content. And if I had been doing it myself, the demands of the real world really would have delayed everything. So having someone push you is, is, a, really, is a really valuable thing. If you do self-produce your own content, I would strongly encourage you to make someone, ask someone who could compel you to finish the material, someone to whom you are accountable. That will help you a great deal to get stuff actually done. And then why screencasting as a medium, medium of instruction? So there are a couple of things. Different people learn in different ways. I personally quite like books, but many other people prefer video as a medium of instruction. And it's easy to understand why, because some people like to have an auditory uh, channel for the information as well, and not just visual. And the big win is if you set up the videos in a way where people can follow along by typing code themselves. So they're watching you doing it, and they're hearing what you're talking about, and they're doing it themselves. And combining all these channels should produce a much better result in terms of learning the material. So on we go to equipment. What you may have thought of is to produce the screencast material, you need a, a very high quality studio, excellent sound equipment, huge dashboard of dials and features and everything. But the reality is that that's what I looked like to my family for a couple of months. I'm barefoot in the corner of a room with my laptop, using Google a lot, producing exercises and producing content. You really don't need much to produce screencast material. The needs are extremely modest. There are two pieces of equipment that are very important though. So the first, the first thing that you really do have to get is a noise cancelling microphone. Don't use the microphone in your laptop. I, I cannot stress this strongly enough. Um, you can't get the noise out of the signal once it's recorded. There's just no way to really deal with that. You can't clean it up. So by recording the, 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 the content that you're talking about as well as you can the first time around matters a huge deal. Re-recording material is no fun whatsoever. It is, it is draining, especially when you have to produce 80 videos. And then you need a little bit of software to actually do the recording. And there are a whole bunch of options. I'm not that familiar with open source options, but I'm sure uh, if you do a bit of searching, you'll find some. And that's the end of the list. That is really all you need to get started. That and some domain knowledge and a message to give people is all you need to begin producing content. Another quick note about the microphone. So this is a photo that the publisher asked me to send them to describe my microphone setup because they wanted very strongly to send me a headset microphone and I kept replying very strongly that I already had a microphone. This is a stage microphone which is excellent for noise cancellation and I use that to produce the course. But the problem with a microphone like this is that every time you turn your head away from the direction of the microphone, the volume changes slightly. So my suggestion is don't do something like this, just invest in a good noise cancelling headset microphone and then that makes sure that the microphone stays in the at the same distance away from your mouth at all times, regardless of where you're looking. Another quick note that, that is extremely valuable. If you, if you can set up a second monitor that you use for the screencast slides and terminal sessions itself, that's really good to do. O'Reilly were quite strict on videos being recorded at 720p. And if that isn't the native resolution of your monitor, it's very easy to record a few videos for the day, log off, and then the next day you log back in, you begin recording, and then you realize too late that you're recording in a different resolution. So having a second monitor set up is, is really valuable for that. And then having a separate user account where you can uh, bind that resolution for the second monitor works really well. In the, in the second user account, you can also change the, the, the desktop background to be gray, 
hide the time, hide the Wi-Fi signal, and all of those things. So you can have a consistent setup every single time. I'm just going to quickly describe more or less how the editing software works. It seems very complex. It's actually not very complex. And I, I got to know Camtasia quite well. Camtasia is a really good option for this. Here you have your editing features. And what I used mostly out of these, out of these options is to expand and contract time. I, I use that a lot. So every time, I, every time you see typing on the screen in my course, that's sped up between 200 and 400%. Because no matter how fast you type, it always looks slow if you watch it after the fact. And that's where you see the preview of, of one of your videos. And then at the bottom, you have uh, the, the tracking system where you can scroll forwards and backwards and chop up your videos and remove dead time and so on. And now we get to content. So for a first time video, I would not suggest doing Cython. <laughs> Even if you know Cython well, to explain everything that goes into how it works turns out to be quite difficult because it involves many different bits and pieces that have to speak together. And in the course, I also cover how to do that on Windows and on Linux and on Mac, including packaging. The combination of those things and how to present those things on screen in a way that is accessible turned out to be quite hard. And these things were difficult in particular. So coming up with good examples, I found really challenging. Once you've exhausted like the, you know, the low hanging fruit, it's really hard to come up with good examples. I knew that my audience was largely going to be data scientists and engineers, but you can't really pick a deep science problem because you alienate the other 90% of, of, of the audience. To get common examples that are accessible to everyone, but are still interesting, I found really difficult to do. I probably spent at least 30% of my time trying to come up with or find good examples. And, and good here also means entertaining. I think it's really important to entertain people because dry content is much harder to learn. Okay, and then Cython specific problems. Cython is an abstraction that covers a whole bunch of other stuff. And you can't really teach it without not mentioning the other stuff. It, it, it turns out to be quite difficult to do. So, it was difficult to decide what to include and what to not include. By not including things, do you set up the, the, the person learning for problems later? So you have to kind of preempt, you have to think it through and you have to preempt situations where you don't cover a particular platform specific problem, but it is likely that they will, they will crash into that later. So then you think, okay, so I should include that just in case they hit that problem, but I can't spend too much time on it and so on. So this, this kind of decision making process was, was quite difficult, really to figure out where to pitch the, the dial, I guess, in, in what material to include and exclude. And again, there, there were many tools involved and I can give you, I think in two more slides, there's an example of an approach that, that, that I used to get around that. Some surprises, so, Screencasting is absolutely not like a conference talk. I'm quite nervous giving, giving this talk. And I had expected before I began that it would be a similar experience and that it would happen 80 times. So it, it was quite daunting. It, it's not like that at all, not, not in any way whatsoever. Screencasting is a lot closer to the experience of writing a book. You can take, do multiple takes. So if you're unhappy with one, you can do it again although it is frustrating to do. It's highly editable, highly, highly editable. So you, you can record a section, type some code in your terminal, sit back, think for five minutes, look out the window, type some more stuff, sit back, go and get some coffee, come back, all while the recording is happening, save it later, you get a three hour dump, and then in your Camtasia tool or similar, you chop out all the dead time, you find the mistakes, you can just re-record those, those bits and put it together, and it looks like a really slick, product at the end. Whereas in a conference talk, you have to kind of go live and we're in that meta stage again where I'm talking about what it's like to give a conference talk while giving a conference talk. So I, I found, initially, my first couple of videos were, were a bit tough, but then afterwards I found that it was really, really easy because you don't have to worry about any of those performance issues. You can say a sentence and you can repeat the same sentence and you, and you might think, I put the emphasis on this word, but it would make more sense to put the emphasis on that word. And then you repeat the sentence with a different emphasis. And later when you get to editing, you can pick which one you want. It's, it's really, really nice in that respect. So if you feel too nervous to give conference talks, think about screencasting as, as a way of um, teaching other people. And then scripting yourself. 
So the first video that I did, my plan was that I would have a free-flowing conversational style where I would um, speak freely and talk about what was on the screen, not really have a too, too tightly scripted um, approach. And that was a really, really bad idea. That, that was awful because you stutter and you um and you are, and the command that you thought would do something does a slightly different thing, and you get some output about deprecation warnings, and oh, I didn't want that there. That didn't work at all. So what, what worked for me, and it may not work for everyone, is to script just about literally every single action that you do. As much as you can script before you record, the better. So that means word for word scripting. Later, once I really got into it, I started to script my mouse movements and even cursor movements, forwards and backwards. And the benefit of doing that kind of prep means that while you're actually doing the recording, you can focus on performance issues like the sound of your voice and where you place emphasis on different parts of the, uh, of the exercise. So preparation really does give you a lot of freedom to make sure that the content is as, as good as you can make it. So I don't want to say that everyone needs to do scripts, but I definitely had to. I had to script just about every single thing that, that you see on the screen. And now we get to the tool section. So we have Jupyter Notebook. Jupyter Notebook hides a lot of what Cython does behind the scenes. So it does the compilation, it does the reloading of the modules. Do I show people how to use Jupyter Notebook? So I opted to do that. I have, a, I have a small section of a couple of videos where I explain how the notebook works and how it maps to uh, Python executing the scripts under the hood. And I put a little bit of effort in to explain what it actually does with Cython. And then I think there were probably 50 or 60 videos that I did just in the notebook. Whether that was good or not is difficult to say. I haven't gotten that much feedback yet, but I am hoping for more. Um, and, then, and then there were a couple of other tools as well. So uh, the, the tools that I used to produce the content were slides in Keynote, a command line, terminal, notebook, and then I used Python 3 with Cython. I realized that I didn't ask for audio. So this, this is a video clip that has audio, so we, might, we may not actually hear anything. Will we hear something if this plays now? <laughs> okay, so that didn't play. So what you would have seen is um, we begin with slides. There's a bit of an introduction. And then the screen changes to a full screen shell with a very large font, I think 20 points, something like that. And in the shell, I type Jupyter Notebook and then the name of a file and I hit enter. And then from the shell, it launches a full screen browser window with the notebook loaded. And I used that recipe for the bulk of the material. Okay, so recording tips. We're almost done. To improve the sound of your voice, drink enough water. Drink enough water the day before you're going to do the recording. Drinking the same day, it turns out, doesn't actually give you enough hydration. This doesn't sound like a real thing until you have to produce really tons of videos and you're talking all day long. That is probably the most important tip of the whole thing, is if you want your voice to sound clear and clean and not begin to crackle at the end of every video, you really do have to, have to stay hydrated. Oops. Get enough sleep. That's the other thing. So if you're tired, you sound tired. It's, it's actually quite interesting. When you, when you play the videos back, you can hear what it sounds like. But when you were recording, you didn't hear, you didn't hear that, that you sounded tired. I found it quite convenient to do all my recording in the morning and then do all the editing in the afternoon. So I'd record back to back three or four videos in the, in the morning and then in the afternoon do the recording. Um, eliminating on-screen distractions. I did speak about that briefly and O'Reilly has a really, really good tutorial on how to do that. And they're quite aggressive about that. They want you to eliminate just about everything you can from your desktop. So gray background, don't show the time, don't show the Wi-Fi signal, don't show any of those little icons in, in the top bar. And um, when, you, when you move the mouse around, make sure to move slowly so that the viewer can see where the mouse cursor moves. They gave a suggestion about putting a piece of blue tack on your screen and parking the mouse at that location between every movement. And doing that would allow them to do edits so that the mouse doesn't change position when they cut a piece out. If you use the two monitor option, like I described earlier, you don't have to do that. Just move the mouse into your presentation screen when you're using it and move it out of the presentation screen when you're not using it. And the last step is to try to entertain people. 
because, again, it's really difficult to learn from dry content. And that's pretty much the end of the, end of the presentation. My, the, the, I guess the, the high level points that I want to give to you is, you can do screencasting, everyone can do screencasting. And if you're nervous about public, public speaking, screencasting is a really excellent way to deliver content to, to other people. It is, however, tons and tons of work. That I found the prep time really, really draining. And lastly, I think having a publisher is, on the whole, better than doing it yourself. For many reasons, uh, not least of which is having those deadlines be enforced to make sure that you really do finish, finish the things. And lastly, I want to give special thanks to Hilary, Meg, and Peter at O'Reilly, who were really a pleasure to work with. I had a lot of fun working with them. And that's it. We have some time for questions. Uh, I'll be right back. Did your voice ever give out? I find after like half an hour of recording a podcast, my voice is just ragged and sore and awful. So like, if you've got any suggestions for that. You... Even if you have a deadline coming up and you've already recorded five videos, don't record more. <laughs> so I, ha I had that as well, the same thing. And if you're doing it day after day, um, and you have to have rest time. If you're doing it day after day, you can't just keep going. So I don't have an answer for that. You just, you just can't do that much of it in one go. I know personally for myself, I actually don't like hearing the sound of my own recorded voice to the extent that I don't like going back and watching PyCon videos where I've done it, when I should, because I've learned from it. Did you have the same issue? I will cringe when I watch this back. <laughs> <laughs> and there's no solution to that. But the thing is, um, you, you can rely on other people. So you can ask people that you trust, how does this sound? Do I sound OK? Do I sound good? And if you trust what they say and they tell you, this is fine, you look great, this content is awesome, you just avoid what, how you feel about yourself, and you just trust them. You just go, OK, I don't feel comfortable about this, but I'm not going to care about that. I'm going to trust what you say as an impartial third party. That works for me. So my publishers said, um, it, funny story. So you as the author are not supposed to edit your videos. You're supposed to just record and send them the raw file, right? I couldn't do that. So, <laughs> so I would record and I would edit my own videos and cut out all the mistakes and then send them a cleanup thing. And I got into trouble many times for that. <laughs> I just, I can't, I can't send people mistakes. It's just... <laughs> uh, you mentioned uh, couldn't find any open source software for screencasting. Did O'Reilly give any support for a commercial license for Camtasia or anything like that? Yeah, so they, they bought a commercial license for Camtasia for me. I think I'm supposed to delete that now. <laughs> I have a vague memory. <laughs> Something. Anyway, yeah, but so, th so they did support that. And they offered to buy me the headset microphone, and I refused. <laughs> Any other questions? No? I have a question. So the total number of hours for the videos is five and a half. How much did you? actually spend how many hours of video is there actually? yeah that's a great question um i spent roughly three months every day so even weekends i, I would just i, I recorded through all of that the time the amount of time you're doing record so the compression time so if you record content how much time of recording ends up as how much time of final footage between five to one and ten to one i would say there were, there were two videos. Um, I'm trying to think if they were packaging videos or if they were wrapping. I think they were wrapping videos. So wrapping C, a C++ library in Windows and then another example in Linux. I spent more than 20 hours prep on each of those. <laughs> and, and each video was 10 minutes long. Yeah. What information do you get back from Riley about uh, how many times videos have been viewed and do you feel that the number of times, times it is being by, viewed by people, do you think you feel that it was worth it or you've like put all this effort in and well no one's watching it?
It's a terrible question. Uh, <laughs> it's a good question. So um, I've, got a, I've got another slide here. OK, so just quickly, there was a book coming out sometime this weekend, which did not come out this weekend, but it will come out in the next few days, which I've written called 20 Libraries You Aren't Using But Should. I was going to have the slide with the URL, but it's not ready. Oops. So, torrents <laughs> downloaded 400 times uh, before O'Reilly got their analytic system set up. Um, I, d I really had no idea. It took, I think it took two months before I could actually see any kinds of figures about sales figures or, or feedback. So I checked to see if anyone was downloading on torrents, and in fact, they were, and in fact, many people were. So, so on the one hand, I thought, wow, 400, wow, that's pretty impressive. You know, it is a couple of gigabytes. But yeah, um, the reviews on O'Reilly are good, and the sales figures are, for me, disappointing, but it is a niche topic within a niche topic. I think the people who, who do get it will get value out of it because the amount of time I took to learn the stuff that's in the video is way, way more than the cost of watching the video. Yeah, I, I spent years learning many other tricks that are in the video. But I don't think in terms of viewership numbers or revenue, it will ever compare to the, to the time of making the material. And I think that's true of, of many educational uh, um, endeavors. You can't really measure the, the contribution in those terms. Or, or if you did, it would, it would never pan out. Does that answer your question? Can we give them another round of applause? <laughs>